seeing the end of it with the, uh, the watermelon and uh, the young man who is being recorded without his knowledge makes you think there's a lot of fun and games to do with the ministry that uh, Sean and Becky are part of. And definitely it seems like they have a lot of fun, but uh, what I also saw in that video that I want to encourage you to see as well is that there were uh, Bible studies, there were baptisms, uh, there were people coming to faith, and most of all, there were people just experiencing the love of Christ through Sean and through Becky and their family. So I know I, for one, am so thankful that we can support them in the ministry that they are part of. So uh, just ask that you continue to pray for and continue to support them as well. This morning, our scripture reading comes from Proverbs 3. We'll be reading verses 1 through 8, as well as verses 11 and 12. Hear now the word of the Lord. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and of man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. And do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. This is the word of the Lord. The Old Testament at times can seem quite foreign to today's reader. Opening, passes, opening its pages may feel like traversing a kind of literary time warp into a whole other world. In that world, sisters and brothers marry. Long hair mysteriously makes men superhuman. And temple altars smell daily of savory, burning flesh and sweet incense. There, desert bushes burn but, leaves no, but leave no ashes. Water gushes from rocks. And cities fall because people marched around them. A different world indeed. Even God, the Old Testament's main character, seems a stranger compared to the more familiar New Testament counterpart. Sometimes the divine is portrayed as a loving father and a faithful friend. Someone who rescues people from the greatest of dangers or generously rewards them for heroic deeds. At other times, however, God resembles a more cruel despot, one furious at human failures raving against enemies and bloodthirsty for revenge, thus skittish about the Old Testament's diverse portrayal of God, some readers carefully select portions of the text to study, or they avoid the Old Testament altogether. Proverbs is one of those books that we carefully select portions to study. We pick and we choose Proverbs that speak to our situation or that predict the outcome that we are hoping for. Others we're not exactly sure what to do with. They seem to speak to Old Testament situations, or to a life that we don't quite understand. It's easier to leave those alone, rather than to try to garner some kind of truth from them, or to apply them to our own life, or to our own situation. Take, for example, Proverbs 27, verse 14. If a man blesses his neighbor early in the morning, it will be taken as a curse. I imagine that if you're waking your neighbor up in order to offer him a blessing, they may very well curse you. But I can think of at least as many contexts in which a neighbor might receive an early morning blessing for what it's meant to be, a blessing. And that precludes the fact that we live in a culture where we don't generally go about blessing our neighbors. And a blessing at any time of day could be met with skepticism. Another proverb that sits funny with us is Proverbs 21, verse 9. Better to live on the corner of a roof than in a house with a quarrelsome wife. 
flat topped roofs in a dry and arid land made it much easier to live on top of a house than it is in our own time with our peaked roofs and with our six months of winter. But this proverb seems to have nothing to say to a woman who lives with a quarrelsome husband. Practically speaking, it would seem to suggest to both husbands and wives that it's good to make every effort to keep the peace within our own houses, as well as to take time to get to know your spouse before you marry them so that you can build a peaceful home. But either way, it takes some point to get to this. We, and we know that you can't just move onto the corner of your roof and expect that things will get better within your house. But that's a proverb for another day. Today we're focused on some of the proverbs that have more to do with parenting or more to do with raising children. It's a baptism Sunday, and Matt and Yvonne have picked Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 to commemorate Mary's baptism. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. This is Matt and Yvonne's prayer for Tamara, and for Gordon as well, that they might learn to trust the Lord with their lives, and that they might grow in faith throughout their whole lives. This is the prayer of our church for each one of our children. Whether they are baptized here in this building or in the other side in the old part of the building a a number of years ago, or if they were baptized in another church and they've come become members of this church after their baptism. And for those of you who are not yet baptized, it's our prayer for you as well that you would accept this sign and this seal as a demonstration of growing faith and growing trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God works through the waters of baptism by his Holy Spirit to increase our faith and to assure us that he is at work in our hearts and in our lives. This is not just a one and done kind of thing. As you heard this morning with the children, the, the water we use in baptism is just ordinary water. It has no saving power in and of itself. In order to understand that she is God's covenant child, Tamara will require a lot more than three handfuls of water splashed against her head. That's why I'm glad, Matt and Yvonne, that you picked these verses to commemorate Tamara's baptism. And that's why I read Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 in the context of a, of a larger section of Scripture rather than as two standalone verses. Proverbs 3 has as much to tell us this morning about how we can grow in our faith and how we can help each other to understand what it means that we are God's covenant children. Proverbs 3 comes as, comes as advice from a father to his son. King Solomon, who these words are attributed to, seems to, in the first eight verses, give his son four bits of advice that each come with a promise. If you do this thing, he seems to say, you'll receive this in return. If you want long life with peace and prosperity, well, don't forget to keep my commands or my teachings in your heart. You want favor and a good, ma- good name among God and men? Well, then cling to love and cling to faithfulness. Bind them around your neck and write them on your heart. If you want to have good health and strong bones, well, then fear the Lord and shun evil. You want to walk a straight path and have an easy life in this lifetime? Well, then trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Sadly, there are people that believe that it's that easy. They think, if I do all these things, then I'm sure to get these in return. And at times, pastors are guilty of encouraging this as well. There are whole churches, especially in the, th- in the southern states, but also in Canada and in, and in other parts of the world, that preach something called the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel preaches that if you do good things, that you're guaranteed to receive good in return. 
Pastors will tell us that the thing God wants for us in this life is to be happy. And that if we trust him, he will give us all the things that we truly need to be happy. But teachings like this seem to skip over the second part of Proverbs 3, verse 5, where Solomon writes, Lean not on your own understanding. The problem with the prosperity gospel is that its adherents convince themselves that what they want for their lives is also what God wants for them. It puts God in a box, and it asks God to operate according to the understanding of the people rather than submitting to God and trusting him to work according to his own perfect will. And it's not just adherence to the prosperity gospel that do this. We do it as well. We do good and we expect good in return. And when things don't go well or when we face job loss, health challenges, or difficulties in relationships, We plead with God to rescue us or to intervene after listing all the good that we've done with the hope that we can persuade God by it. Solomon says to his son, Do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. Like any good parent, he wants his children, or he wants to set his child on the right path. He wants them to do well in life, not just to survive, but to thrive. But he knows that it's not his own way that he must teach to his child. It's not his own definition of success or of thriving that he shares. Rather, he turns his child's attention to the Lord. Love and faithfulness. The content of the second command that we read this morning are their covenantal terms. There are two major themes that occur throughout the Old Testament. Scripture speaks of God's love and of God's faithfulness toward his people. And here, Solomon wants his son, and he wants us as his readers, to emulate that love and that faithfulness within our own lives. He wants us to respond to it. He wants us to live within it, making it a key part of our lives. But what we have to understand about covenant is that it's primarily God's action in working for us. And it's always God who acts first. In Genesis 12, the Lord appears to Abraham and he gives him this promise. He says, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to a land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, God says, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Then in chapter 15, he says to Abraham, Do not be afraid. I'm your shield and your reward, your shield and your very great reward. Now, at this point in Abraham's life, he still hasn't received the full blessing of the promise that God has given him. He's neither taken the possession of the land that was promised to him, nor has he received the promised heir. And so, in one of those weird Old Testament texts that that seems to be from another world, God has Abraham bring him an offering of a cow, a goat, and a sheep, which are each three years old, along with a dove and a a young pigeon. And so Abraham lays out this offering according to the tradition of that time, which meant that he took the the larger animals, he cut them in half, and he lays out the pieces opposite each other. And the two birds he lays out, one on each side. And then we read this. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep. A thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they served as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation... 
Your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its fullest measure. And if you think it's strange that God's making this promise to to Abraham as he's in a deep and a dreadful sleep, then think about what happens next. We continue to read and it says, When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants, I give this land. Now this is one of those things that we scratch our heads as we wonder what's actually happening. A smoking fire pot and a blazing torch make their way through the middle of this offering. As Abraham's off to the side in a deep and a dreadful sleep, what does this mean? Well, in that time, If two people were to make a commitment to one another, if they entered into a contract or a covenant with one another, they would lay out an offering in the way that Abraham did. And then the two of them would walk together between the pieces of the offering as a sign of their commitment to the covenant that they were making. And if one or if the other did not uphold their end of this covenant, it was punishable by death. So by causing Abraham to fall into a deep sleep and then passing through the offering in the form of a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch, God takes on full responsibility for the carrying through of this covenant. God knows that Abraham will fail. He knows that Abraham will fall short in his trust of him. He knows that Abraham will go to foreign lands to find food. And he knows that Abraham will twice pretend that his wife Sarah is his sister in order to save his own life. He knows that Abraham will take his wife's servant in order to produce an heir because in Abraham's estimation, God's not following through on his end of the promise. All this God knows. And so he takes full responsibility for the covenant on his own. God takes both sides of the covenant, committing to take on the full cost should one or the other fail in keeping this covenant. We know in reading Genesis that Abraham failed in keeping up his end of the covenant. We know in reading the the rest of the Old Testament that the people of Israel failed in keeping their end of the covenant as well. And we know in reading the New Testament that God not only upheld his end of the covenant, he also graciously sent his son, Jesus, to pay the price for our failure to uphold our end of the covenant as well. God is a covenant God, and we are his covenant people. Baptism is our sign of the covenant promises that God gives to us through his son, Jesus Christ and in the power of his Holy Spirit. Baptism is our participation in the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We know that Tamara will fall short in her lifetime. We know that at times she will lean on her own understanding rather than on the Lord's understanding, and that she will in ways refuse submit to, refuse to, submit to the Lord. We know that she like the rest of us, will indeed fail to cling to, the, to God's love and faithfulness, and she will try to go her own way. But we also know that God's grace and mercy will never fail. We know that his love and his faithfulness will last beyond the generations, and we know that he will sustain each of us, Tamara included, by the power of his Holy Spirit. This is why we baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And this is why we baptize children as well, because God graciously included them in his covenant, and he desires for them to know this saving grace is for them as well. Matt and Ivan, in presenting Tamara for baptism this morning, you're committing to help her to understand what it means to trust the Lord with all your heart and to lean not on your own understanding. You're helping 
You're committing to help her submit her ways to him. This is a big commitment. But you're also doing that in the presence of brothers and sisters in Christ who have committed to walking alongside you and to walking alongside her and to helping you in these ways. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for making this commitment to Matt and to Ivan and to their children and to each of the children of this congregation. And I ask you to uphold this commitment through daily prayer and through active participation in their lives so that they can see what an active and what a growing faith looks like. Let's make that our prayer this morning. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we give thanks, Lord, for the gift of baptism. We give thanks for this sign and the seal, Lord, of what you have done through your Son, Jesus Christ, who suffered and died on the cross to pay the full price for all our sin. Lord, we pray this morning. We pray for Tamara on this day of her baptism that you might claim her as your own and that you might pursue her, Lord, that you might uh, fill her life with your spirit, that she may live her whole life for you and as a witness to your grace and mercy. And we pray, Lord, for her parents, for her family, and for her family in Christ who is here this morning, Lord, that we may walk alongside her, that we may encourage her, that we may help demonstrate what it is to have an active and a growing faith, Lord, so that she can learn for us. I pray, too, that we may pray for her and for all children of this congregation, Lord, young and old alike, that we can pray for them continually, that your spirit will be active in, in each of our lives, Lord. We pray this in the name of your Son and the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.